All right. Anybody happy to be in church today? Can you look at somebody and say, I'm glad I'm sitting next to you? Look at somebody else say, you're my backup plan. It's my joke. I use it all the time. Um, it's not really my joke. I stole it from somebody else, but I like it. I'm excited to jump right into the Bible this, this uh, morning. It's still morning, right? Yeah. I'm excited to jump right into the Bible. Uh, before I do that, uh, we just finished a worship conference last night. And so if you wonder where that video came from, uh, it's because we had a worship conference last night. I just believe that the presence of God uh, is still in the room. He still wants to move. And it's like there's a residual of his goodness, a residual of his presence here ready to move. And, and so we just believe that today. Um, before I read the Bible, um, let me just honor our lead pastors, Pastor Jerry and Pastor Tammy. Um, I love uh, in the, I've been on staff here for about 15, 16 years now, which seems crazy, full-time staff with Pastor Jerry and Pastor Tammy. But I love that they always, always stand with the truth, no matter what's popular, no matter what's comfortable, they're always willing to say, we stand on this, stand on the Bible. And uh, so today we're going to read from that. But uh, can we just take a minute and just honor Pastor Jerry and Tammy? Just say thank you. Thank you. Hmm. All right, I'm going to jump into Jan Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 to 23. It's a big chunk of scripture, so you could open it up in your Bible if you'd like. You can look at the Bible in the sky behind me. Um, it says this. Verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. This 90-foot statue with, that's 9 foot in diameter uh, probably weighed uh, about 9 million pounds, if you can imagine. 9 million pounds of a golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had put together and put it in perspective uh, right now that would be three percent of the world's gold that has been mined in the whole world uh, half of the world's gold has been mined probably in the last 50 years or so or since the 1950s um, maybe at that time this could have been half of the world's supply of gold that shows you the value that they put into this idol verse 2 then he sent messages to all the, uh, all the princes, governors, captains, judges, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, rulers of all the provinces of his empire to come to the dedication of his statue. When they had all arrived and were standing before the monument, a herald shouted, O people of all nations, O people of all languages, this is the king's command. When the band strikes up, you are to fall flat on the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue. This is the idol that the whole world was called to bow to. We still have idols today, don't we? We still have things that the world would tell us to bow to, don't we? Verse 6, anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a flaming furnace. That doesn't sound good, does it? We're faced with a decision. You either bow down to the idols, you bow down to the world. And if you don't do that, then you get thrown into the fiery furnace. Verse 7, so when the band began to play, everyone, whatever his nation, whatever language, whatever religion, fell down to the ground and worshipped the statue. But some officials went to the king and accused some of the Jews of refusing to worship. I believe that today as we jump into this message on faith that The testimony of our church today is that some of the city church, some of the Christians of the city church, some of the people that come to city church today, that the testimony of this place would be that we would not bow down to the idols of this world. 
Verse 9, your majesty, they said to him, you made a law that everyone must fall down and worship the gold statue when the band begins to play and that anyone who refuses will be thrown into a flaming furnace. But there are some Jews out there. Nobody likes a tattletale, right? There are some Jews out there, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the Babylonian affairs who have defiled you, refusing to serve your gods or to bow down to worship the golden statue that you set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a terrible rage, ordered Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego to be brought in before him. Is it true? He asked them. Is it true? Is it true, he demanded, that you refuse to bow down? You refuse to bow down? You refuse to bow down to my culture? You refuse to bow down to my God? You refuse to bow down to my statue, my idol? Have you ever been persecuted for your faith? You ever been made fun of for your faith? Nebuchadnezzar says to them, I'll give you one more chance, one more chance. When the music plays, you will bow down. If you don't bow down, within an hour, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. And what God, he asked them, can deliver you out of my hands then? And this is where the faith language comes in. We're on a series on faith. Pastor Jerry started a series on faith. We're going to be on it all summer. But this is where the faith language that we learned today of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego comes into play. When Nebuchadnezzar says, who will save you? What God can save you? They say to him, O Nebuchadnezzar, verse 16, we are not worried about what will happen to us. If we are thrown into the flaming, burning furnace, if we are thrown into the furnace, our God is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us out of your hand, your majesty. One of the greatest faith statements in the entire Bible, verse 18 says, but if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, please understand, sir, that even then we will never, the city church will never, I will never, under any circumstances, serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you have erected. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and his face became dark with anger and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He commanded that the furnace be heated up seven times as hot and called for some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and they threw them into the fire. So they bound them tight with robes ropes and threw them into the furnace fully clothed and because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace the flames leaped out and it killed the soldiers that threw them in so Shadrach Meshach and Abednego fell down bound into the roaring flames for just a few minutes today I want to talk to you on the subject of faith through the fire faith through the fire. Would you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you for this story. Thank you for the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And maybe thousands of years ago, this story took place, but it's still relevant to us today. And God, out of their story, out of the lessons of faith that we learned from them, one of the greatest stories on faith in all of the Bible, that we would grab hold of the principles that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would teach us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brittany. When I became a Christian uh, 20 years ago, everything changed. Anybody experienced that? Anybody experienced when you give your life to Jesus and how everything changes? Most of it was, was great. I mean, for sure, eternity was great. I walked into that moment of... Uh, it was a worship conference, and uh, I was in the back of the room, and I walked in, and I just God started talking to me. I walked in the room with the heaviness, with the baggage, with shame, with guilt, with addiction, uh, with a party lifestyle, with so much that um, was just heavy. And in a moment, 
I said yes to give my life to Jesus and he took the weight, he took the heaviness and he brought this comfort and this peace that was just so real. Everything changed when I gave my life to Jesus. Everything changed. I mean, most of it got way better, but to be honest, some of it, some of it got harder. I don't know if you've experienced that, but I felt this peace, I felt this joy, I felt the weight lift, uh, and my faith had really changed me. But my faith also changed some of the circumstances, some of the situation of what my life looked like. I was 20 years old, I was in a fraternity in college, and it was all about partying, it was all about girls, it was all about sex, it was all about addictions, it was all about, you know, just living a pretty intense, carnal life. But when I became a Christian, most of my friends, they didn't like my new lifestyle. Some of my family didn't like my new lifestyle. Most of my fraternity, they didn't like my new life, that everything had changed. And so instead of feeling like everything was better, you know, I think a lot of times we think that, right? You become a Christian and everything's going to get better. But it doesn't always all get better, right? So I'd go home, home to all these friends that they used to be my friends, and now they just make fun of me. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And it got harder. And I get it. I get the way that they responded, because me as a Christian, I didn't have the most tact. I cared about what God had done to me, and I wanted everybody to know that. I wanted everybody to see that, and I wanted everybody to experience that, but I didn't share it perfectly with them. You know, when you go to somebody and you say, I'm a Christian now, everything changed for me, God saved me, and so now I want you to do the same thing. So you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. You got to stop doing that. You got to stop drinking. You got to stop hanging out with the girls. And by the way, God loves you. They're like, <laughs> feels judgmental. I didn't have a lot, of, a lot of tact in how I shared my faith in the beginning. To my friends, because I had been a Christian maybe five minutes, I was a hypocrite. I was a liar. I was living a double life. They'd seen me this way for five minutes and they didn't know, was my faith real? Was this real? Or was I just telling them how bad they were? And so a lot of them stopped being my friends. I realized that in my faith, of course God had touched me, God had changed me, he set me up for eternity with him, he'd forgiven me and I felt that, but not everything was perfect. And a lot of it got harder. And I realized as a Christian that real faith, real faith always, real faith always comes with a cost. Real faith always comes with a fire. Real faith always comes with moments of difficulty. 2 Timothy 3.12 in the Amplified says this. It says, indeed, all who delight in pursuing righteousness. This is Paul talking to Timothy, one of his number one disciples. He says to this in this letter that he sends him, indeed, all who delight in pursuing righteousness and are determined to live godly lives in Christ Jesus. Every Christian will be hunted and will be persecuted because of their faith. Thanks for coming to church today. <laughs> that doesn't sound <laughs> super great, right? Like, I just wanted some donuts and coffee. <laughs> Can we just have hot dogs again? Like, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar, he saw their faith and he said, because you won't bow down, because you won't uh, worship the idols that I put up, I'm not just going to throw you in the fire, but he says, I'm going to turn it up seven times is hot. Have you ever felt the weight, the difficulty when you become a Christian that maybe everything doesn't always get better? The kind of faith that God wants us to have, though, the kind of faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if they walked into the room and they said, this is the kind of faith I want you to have, the kind of faith they want you to have is faith that gets you through the fire. Because the reality of life is that life will take you to the fire, won't it? Sometimes when you believe and you have faith and you stand up for what you believe in, the people maybe that are the closest to you, 
will throw you in the fire. Persecution comes. Difficulty comes. But God wants us to have the kind of faith that doesn't just get us to the fire because uh, that's what life will do. And sometimes faith will get you to the fire because of the persecution around you. But God wants you to have faith that doesn't get you to the fire but gets you through the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego give us an example of true faith in this story. Now to set the context, Babylon, the city that they're in, the culture that they're in, uh, they had been in this culture for 70 years. And the Babylonians had taken the Israelites captive. They had torn down Jerusalem, torn down the temple, and had taken captive the Israelites. Now some of the Israelites uh, uh, bowed down. Some of the Israelites adapted to the culture. And some of the Israelites didn't. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were a couple of the, uh, the Israelites that wouldn't. But what the Babylonians did is they said, what we're going to do is we're going to take the next generation. We're going to take the children of the next generation. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not in their 40s. They were not in their 50s. They were not old men. They were probably in their teens, maybe junior hires. And King Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going after the next generation. And if I can get the best of the next generation to follow me, then the whole generation will follow me. There is still an attack on the next generation isn't there? Culture wants the next generation. It was an anti-God, polytheistic, pagan culture. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow down. They had true faith. In their true faith, we find three postures. Three postures in their faith. How do we learn from uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? The three postures of their faith were the, the first one is that they, that true faith that we learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. True faith always stands with God's word. True faith always stands with God's word. True faith, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego type faith always stands with God's word. Now this week, um, sometimes you preach a message and sometimes the message preaches to you. And all week, I, I feel like, I don't know if I've ever wrestled Uh, with a message as much as this one. I don't feel like I've ever been challenged personally by something God spoke to me as much as I was this week. And God asked me this question uh, this week. He said, where are you sitting and where should you be standing according to the Bible? Because there's a lot of areas in my life where if I'm real honest, I'm okay putting the Bible in the peripheral in order to appease the culture, to make sure I don't offend anybody, make sure that, you know, maybe it's just a little bit easier if I just put this truth, not all the way off, but just in the peripheral. True faith in God's word means that you always stand on his word. It means that your God conscience always has to be stronger than the consequence. Your God conscience Your willingness to stand on whatever God says is bigger than whatever the consequence is. Because sometimes when we take a stand that's in here, it offends somebody. It bothers somebody. It hurts somebody. And we're never doing this against people. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not stand up and then look at everybody that was bowing down and they weren't the problem. He wasn't saying, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad for bowing down. They weren't standing against them. What they were standing on is they were standing for the truth. And the truth that they lived by were the Ten Commandments. The first one says that you will put no other God before me. No other God before the God of heaven. And that's what they live by. Faith stands for something. It stands on something. It stands on the word. And if you don't stand for this, then you'll fall for anything. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14 says this, be on guard. Be on guard, Christians. Be on guard, city church. Be on guard, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Be on guard. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything with love. In the message, it says, keep your eyes open. Hold tight to your convictions. Give it all you've got. Be resolute in love without stopping. We stand on the truth and we love others in the journey. Now, one thing that makes it easier, because it sounds heavy and it sounds hard, one thing that makes it easier is that we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
It wasn't just Shadrach standing. It wasn't just Meshach standing. It wasn't just Abednego standing. It was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. One way that this makes, it makes it easier to stand up in a culture that would try and tear you down. To stand up in a culture that would try and throw you to the wayside because you believe and you stand in Jesus. You come to church, you believe in truth, you stand for the Bible, you believe for the Bible. Is that you have friends that stand for the same thing. That's why we have small groups in our church. That's why we, we, we set aside time twice a month that we would say, we're going to go after the Bible together. We're going to build each other up together. We're going to stand strong with each other. We're going to hold each other up, build each other up. There's no time in, the, in this entire passage that you just see Shadrach or you just, just see uh, Abednego or you just see Ma- Meshach. It's always Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego together. How do you get through this? How do you stand for, for, on truth? How do you stand for the Bible? How do you stand up against the culture that tries to tear you down? The way that you do it is you have friends around you. That's why some of your closest friends should be the people that are sitting around you right now. And the word is always right. When you stand for this, you are always standing for what is right. It doesn't mean that it will be easy, but it means that you will be standing for righteousness. And that's what we learned from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. First thing we learned from them in the posture of faith is that they stand always, always, because true faith always stands for God's word. Second thing we learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that true faith only bows to God. True faith only bows to God. Your worship can never be towards the world. Your worship can only be towards God. Now, everybody was bowing before this 90-foot statue, nine feet in diameter, weighed nine million pounds. What's interesting, I looked up uh, what the value of this statue would be today. $200 billion. Do you know how rich the richest man in the world, richest person in the world is? His net worth is just about $200 billion. What are you bowing to right now? God asked me that this week. He said, Gabe, what are you bowing to? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what did they bow to? They bowed, they said, I will only bow to God. I will only bow to the one true God. I will only bow to Jesus. I will only bow to him. And God asked me this week, Gabe, who are you bowing to? I said, you. And he said, and? I said, no, 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 just you. And he said, and? I said, oh, yeah. I kind of bow to finances, especially right now, right? It's fun to go on a slide when you're at the park, but <laughs> when your 401k looks like this, it starts getting your attention, right? And you start to bow down before it or maybe spend time looking at it. God will never settle in worship. He will never settle for God plus anything. What are we bowing to right now? Exodus 20 and verses 3 to 5 says that you shall have no other gods before me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew this. You will have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And when the music starts and the world says, bow to me, will you bow? Or will you only bow to the name of Jesus, the name above every name, before whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is the only one worthy of our worship. And sometimes when we worship him and sometimes when we bow before him, 
other people want to put us in the fire. There's a cost to faith. Third posture that we learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that true faith. True faith always stands for God's word. True faith only bows to God. And the third one is that true faith walks with Jesus in the fire. True faith walks with Jesus in the fire. True faith means that when you're in the difficulty, that you stick with Jesus. The world will get you to the fire, but God will get you through the fire. And that doesn't mean that everything, because we want it to, right? And I wanted it to, and I thought that it would when I first became a Christian, that when I become a Christian, everything gets better. And everything works out, but it doesn't, does it? You know, I just want my life to be better right now. I just want my prayer answered right now. I want my marriage better right now. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, no, even if you don't, even if he doesn't, I will not bow down. I will not bow down to this culture. I will not bow down to the pagan culture. I will not bow down to any other God but my God. I will not give credence. I will not give time. I will not give attention to anything that, that does not line up with the principles of the word and the promise of who God is in his presence in my life. True faith, because true faith doesn't always lead you to a place where everything is always good. It doesn't lead you to a place where no one will ever get sick. It doesn't lead you to a place where we all live forever on earth. That's not true faith. True faith leads you to a God who is always good, where sickness never has the final say, and where we all live forever in heaven with him. When Gabby and I were in our first year of marriage, and... uh, we're working at the church and we're doing our best and we're trying to put God first. And we left church on a, on a Saturday. It was a week ago from, from yesterday. And we're walking out into the parking lot and we get a phone call. And the phone call says that uh, Gabby's uh, older brother, who was more like a, a dad in a way, was like 12, 13 years older than her. Um, we get a call and it says that he got in a trucking accident and he died wow, that hits you. He hits a truck ramp and the truck starts, goes into flames and he dies in the, in the accident. And you think, where's God in that? Gabby had prayed for years that her brother would never specifically, he would not die in a trucking accident and that's how he passes away. And you think, where's God in that? Why didn't my faith work? Psalm 23 and verse 4 says, though, it says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even in death, death does not win. So we get a phone call the next week after he passes away, and he had just uh, started going back to church, putting God first. They said, we got this record of him. He just keeps giving. He kept giving and kept giving to the church. And a couple of truckers, they're driving by the site where he had passed away. And over the radio, they start saying, you know, this is the guy that just last week, he said, I want to start a trucking ministry. And he started sharing the gospel on the radio. And people's lives got touched because of him. Because death doesn't win. And the fire doesn't win. And God says, I will walk you. Even though you go through the shadow, uh, the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil because God is with you. And here we see Nebuchadnezzar watching the entire time. And the world is watching the entire time. What will we do in the fire? How will we live in the fire? Will we stand even at the cost of the fire? Will we bow down so we stay out of the fire? Or will we stand for what we believe in? Because true faith, there will be persecution. There will be difficulty. It will lead you to times in the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar, it says, was watching the entire time. He saw the men die, throwing them in. That's how hot the fire was. They saw them thrown in. It says in verse 24, suddenly, as he was watching, Nebuchadnezzar jumps up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we throw three men into the fire? Yes, they said, we did indeed, your majesty. Well, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four. I see four unbound, 
walking in the fire. The posture of our Christianity is that we stand for God. We stand for truth no matter what. We bow only to God and we walk with him in the fire. And he says, I'm not just going to walk you to the fire. I'm going to walk you through the fire. But what's the story say? It says three men walked into the fire, but there was a fourth one in the fire. Jesus, a Christophany in the Old Testament, where Jesus comes down in the Old Testament, is with them in the fire. Get this, how many walked into the fire? It's a really easy math question. Three walk into the fire. How many are in the fire? How many walk out of the fire? Three. Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Nebuchadnezzar watched him, watched him go in the fire. He said, I saw three go in, but there's four. Jesus says to you, I will always meet you in the fire. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Three go in, four are in the fire, and three leave. Jesus will wait for you. If you stand for him, he will wait for you. If you stand for him, he will wait for you. If you stand for this, he will wait for you. If you bow down only to him, he will wait for you. He says, I will meet you every fire you ever go into. I will walk you through it. And what happens in the story? It says that the, verse 27, the princes, the governors, the captains, the counselors crowded around them and they saw that the fire hadn't touched them. Not a hair of their heads was singed. Their coats were unscorned. And they didn't even smell like smoke. Nebuchadnezzar said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And everything changed. Everything didn't change when they stood up for truth. Everything didn't change when they didn't bow down to the other God. For Nebuchadnezzar, who's the one that threw them in the fire, everything changed when he saw how they acted when they got in the fire. People are watching. The world is watching. The world is looking. How will you respond in the fire? How will you respond in the difficulty? How will we live out our faith according to the truth and not bowing down to the word? And how will we act and how will we respond when things are hard? And the world is watching and Nebuchadnezzar makes a decree that no one will worship any other God but the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the God who was in the fire. That's the kind of church God wants. That's the kind of faith he wants us to have. The kind of faith that says, I will stand on truth. I will bow down to none other than God himself. And I will walk with Jesus. I will walk with Jesus. I will walk with Jesus even when it's hard. I will walk with Jesus even when it's difficult. I will walk with Jesus and he will be with me. And the world will see that our faith means something. God, I just pray, God, that we would respond to this message. God, how would you speak to us? What would you say to us? God, what would you say to us today? You asked me those questions this week. What do I need? Where, what area do I need to stand in the Bible? I need to stand in God's word and that I'm not. And I think God would ask us the same question today. What areas do I need to stand for scripture? I need to stand for truth, not stand with what the world says, not what, what the world says is right. What areas do I need to stand according to the truth of the Bible? I believe God had asked us the same question he asked me. What am I bowing to that isn't Jesus? What areas of my life am I bowing to? It's not God. This is not condemnation. This isn't meant to make us feel heavy or bad. It's meant to bring freedom. God would ask us today, will you stand for me and me alone? Will you stand for the truth and the truth alone? Or will you bow and bow only to me? So that when we walk out of this room, we walk out in faith, willing to live our faith no matter what the cost, so that the world will see that even when we go through the difficulty, even when it's hard, even when I will 
worship because he's worthy of my worship. I will put him first because he's worthy of it, because he's good. God, we just say yes to that in Jesus' name.